All right, so maybe I, I, I should get started. So hi, everyone. Welcome back to this series of lectures on uh, statistical mechanics of disordered systems. So as a reminder, last time uh, we covered rather quickly uh, this chapter one on large deviations and convex analysis. So I, I wanted you to have uh, some sort of bird's eye view on what large deviations are and also mention this uh, result of convex analysis about taking the dual of the dual of a function and uh, when it is that we recover this function. And we saw it happens whenever the function is convex and lower semi-continuous. Uh, so I, I put a lot of math uh, into last time, uh, last time's lecture. I think today it will be more of a, um, uh, the content will be more of a, uh, background and uh, historical comments about uh, statistical mechanics in general and why uh, we want to study statistical mechanics, how it, how it comes to be. So, but overall, the, the, the chapter is on, on Curie Weiss models, so a specific model of statistical mechanics. Uh, before I, I go into this, are there specific questions on, on what we have done last time? So if not, I'm going to uh, start with the, the first section on Gibbs measures. So Gibbs, I think his first name was uh, uh, Josiah. He was a, a scientist, a theoretician working uh, in the US near the, the end of the 19th century. And as far as I know, he's the guy who uh, coined the term statistical mechanics. And, and now, yeah, we have this thing called Gibbs measure. So I'm going to explain uh, uh, some easy way to understand how Gibbs measures can arise, or at least some relatively simple context in which uh, we can think that they arise. So suppose that uh, we have um, we have n units, maybe uh, particles. So we have So initially, people were interested in, in uh, uh, st studying matter. So you can think that uh, each unit is an atom, and maybe it has different states. So each unit, uh, oops, each unit can be in a number of states. Let's say uh, k states. And we think of this number of states as being fixed and the number of uh, particles or, or units, this capital N as being very, very large. Ultimately, I want to take N going to infinity, but K will remain fixed. Um, okay. And when a particle is in a given state, it has a certain energy. So each uh, state, uh, little k, as an associated energy. I will denote it EK. And the our system of N particles is isolated from the rest of the universe, or maybe it's the entire universe. Uh, and so the, the total energy of the system is conserved, okay, it's fixed. Um, and the total energy of the system is fixed. And I want to take it proportional to the number of units, so proportional to n. Uh, so say n times e bar for some uh, fixed e bar. Okay. So E bar is some number which we fix. And I postulate that the total energy of the system is N E bar, and each unit can decide to occupy um, a state one, two, three, up to K, 
And if it's in, in state two, let's say, then its energy is E2. And then uh, uh, the same for each unit. And then the total energy is the sum of, of the energies of each unit. OK. So, OK, so maybe I'm going to write it like this. Um, when I sum uh, the, the number of particles in state k, I'm going to write nk times the energy of the state. I want this to be equal to uh, this big N times E bar. Okay, so where NK NK is the number of units in state K. So far, so good. And the question I want to ask is, so, so there is, this is one constraint, but it does not fully specify the microscopic uh, details of the model. We don't know by, by this prescription whether the first unit has energy E1 or E2 or E5. It's just this global constraint which is imposed. And um, from a physics perspective, I think it's uh, Bosman who postulated that in fact the system will choose um, its uh, state uniformly among all uh, possible achievable configurations. At least uh, uh, this is what I'm going to postulate. Okay, so we have one constraint in the system: this the sum of these n k's, uh, e k's has to be a specific number. You know this. This prescribes a subset of the space of all possible configurations. And I'm postulating that the system is, is distributed uniformly uh, over this set. Okay, and, and, and like for, for this discussion, I'm ignoring um, you know, whether or not uh, uh, things lie on an integer, you know, maybe uh, you know, if E bar is, is not properly set, maybe this relation is not possible, etc. So I, I'm ignoring this. So maybe you should think that. When I write identities here, it's like up to a tiny approximation so that we don't have to worry about taking integer parts. Okay, so I okay, so so uh, postulate that the system is uniformly distributed. among all these configurations, which satisfy the constraint. Okay, and the question I want to ask is, given that, what is the chance that a given unit, uh, let's say the first unit, is in a particular state, let's say K. Okay, so in other words, I want to know, um, under this assumption, how does this number NK divided by N look like? And if you have thought about the second exercise of the first problem set, then it should ring a bell. It's kind of related. Okay, NK over N, you can think of this as the probability that a given unit is in state K. So if I if I so I'm going to uh, re rephrase a bit the question. I, I can ask if I fix these numbers n one up to n capital K, how many configurations are there which are consistent with these numbers? So let's say number of configurations. Okay, so I'm, I'm going a bit, uh, I'm not being very precise because it's just a motivating uh, discussion I want to do here. But I'm, you know, I'm thinking I'm fixing this list of numbers and one of two NK. I'm asking how many um, microscopic choices I can do so that uh, the number of particles in, in state one is N1, et cetera. And, and this, uh, this is just the, Multinomial coefficient, n factorial. 
divided by n1 factorial, etc., up to nk factorial. And now, you know, it's, it's like uh, what uh, we discussed at the beginning of last lecture. I want to understand the asymptotics of this when n becomes large, and all of these uh, nk's um, are are proportional to n. So say nk over n is approximately fixed, equal to pk, just like uh, we have done with this x last time. So I, I'm thinking that pk is essentially fixed, and n is going to infinity with this relation being preserved. And, and then I, I can uh, do my uh, Stirling's approximation again on these uh, uh, factorial coefficients. So what happens if you want, last time what we have done is the uh, capital K equals two. So, so log of n factorial is, we saw that it's about n log n minus n plus uh, big O of log n, okay? And then there are the, I should put minus, sorry. There are the other guys, so some, and nk I'm going to write pk times n, so pk n log pk n minus pk n, and then there is my error term, okay, plus O of log n. And yeah, I should have said earlier, but observe that this pk, uh, it is such that the sum of the pk is equal to one, okay? Because it's the proportion, pk is the proportion of particles in state k. So if I sum, I get, uh, you know, uh, I get everything. So, so we see that there are cancellations uh, as we had seen uh, yesterday in this formula. So the n log n's disappear. The minus n and the minus pk n also disappear. And what remains is n times the sum of pk. So instead of writing, yeah, okay, maybe I should write minus. Oh, okay, I like to write it like this because it's clear that it's not negative. PK log of one over PK. Um, the tilde over the single bar. I don't understand the question in the chat. Maybe it's because I, I is there a typo? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry. Thanks, uh, someone understood the question. By this, I mean, it's, it's essentially equal, but uh, you know, maybe because of uh, integer, you know, in taking the integer part considerations, maybe it's not exactly equal. So I mean, uh, equal up to a very small error. Yeah, thanks for this question. And thanks for the person who understood the question. Okay, and, and so this is our generalization of uh, the quantity we had seen last time for k equals two. Um, and I'm going to call it S of p, the entropy of p. So, so this tells us, you know, if I, if I fix, certain proportions of uh, type one, type two, et cetera, it tells me that the, the total number of uh, possible uh, ways to realize this choice is approximately exponential of n times S of P okay, for, a, for a fixed choice of, of P. So, so surely our system will, will because we, we take things uniformly at random, it will prefer those choices of P which maximize S of P. Okay, again, this is in the spirit of this first exercise uh, of the first problem set, because um, you know, if we have, let's say two choices for P, just to make, uh, to, to discuss it easily, one will be exponentially larger in N than the other. So, so 
in the limit of large n, we will overwhelmingly only see uh, the p's which maximize s of p. Okay, so, so the, the moral of this story is that the system will want to maximize s of p. It will choose the p that maximizes s of p. However, we have to, to remember that there is, uh, we have to still satisfy the constraint of the total energy being n times e bar. Okay, so uh, our system. Maximize, let's say to concentrate on, on these vector P's that maximize S, but subject to the constraints that the So the, the total energy, okay, it's sum of nk, I'm, I'm rewriting it, equals n e bar, but nk, uh, we said it's pk times n. So let me rewrite this as like this. So pk, ek equals e bar. And of course, there's also the constraint that the sum of the pks is equal to one. Okay, and, and the PKs are non-negative. Okay, so I, I was a bit quick, but I'm, I'm saying that, you know, if you take, let's say two competing Ps uh, satisfying the constraint and one has larger S than the other, there will be exponentially many more uh, configurations for, for the one with the larger S. So when we take uh, something at random, and there's this huge collection of things that next to something exponentially smaller, uh, we will select only from the from the big bag, okay, from the guy which maximizes S of P. All right, so, so what does it mean? So what is this uh, maximizer looking like? No, so I'm asking myself now, you know, this is a simple optimization problem. Uh, I'm looking for the vector P which maximizes S subject to the constraints that are written. And so I can, I can apply uh, the Lagrange multiplier theorem. And I know that the, the, when I, the, the gradient of S at this optimizer is, has to be uh, in the linear span of the gradient of these uh, functional constraints. So the maximizer, Oh yeah, and I should have said. Notice also that this function s of p is a convex function of p. Okay, so because x, um, let me get it. So yeah, so sorry, because I put one over, so it's a concave function. So it's minus x log x. This is a concave function. And we are, so it's a concave fun function of the vector of pk's which we optimize over a linear subspace, or in fact, maybe a convex subspace. So, so there will be a unique optimizer and it is characterized by the fact that there exists, so is, so P is such that, there exists alpha and beta satisfying every k so we want that the the derivative of s with respect to pk is proportional to uh, the derivative of of this functional so it's just alpha oh, I should erase this yeah, plus the derivative of uh, with some other multiplicative, multiplicative factor times the derivative of this other functional. So here we get some EK.
Okay, so so now we um, we look into the function s and look at what this derivative is. So s is minus pk log pk. So when I differentiate, I will get minus log pk when I differentiate the, the, the pk. And then if I differentiate the log, I get minus one. Okay, so minus one, I can absorb into the alpha if I want. Okay, it's just a constant. And so what, what we find here is that uh, pk should be proportional to, and I'm going to write one over z for the, I'm going to call one over z, one over z uh, the proportionality constant. pk should be proportional to the exponential of minus beta ek. Okay, so this is what I wanted to arrive at. So if I if I summarize what uh, what has been done here, we we take this isolated system with lots of units. Each of the units has uh, k accessible states, and we say the the system is going to choose uniformly at random over all accessible possible configurations. And we ask, uh, what does a typical unit? Uh, uh, you know what in what state does a, a typical unit find itself if we let uh, this n go to infinity and the answer is we're going to find it uh, according to this probability p described like we, such that pk is proportional to exponential minus beta ek okay and that's what the gibbs measure is is that i give you an energy function here the the this e1 up to e, e capital k and you construct, you, you give yourself some beta and you construct um, the probability proportional to exponential minus beta ek. That's the, what a Gibbs measure is. Um, and, and beta is called the inverse temperature. So that's, this is, a, uh, this is what the Gibbs measure is. This is the Gibbs measure. Associated with the this vector uh, of of energy, and beta is called the inverse temperature. And uh, yeah, okay, so I should. It it is prescribed. So you know, how do you find beta in this problem? It's is prescribed by the requirement that the, the average energy is equal to E bar. Okay, so for each E bar, there will be one choice of beta. And okay, maybe it's not immediately intuitive that this is the inverse temperature, but at some point, if you want to answer the question, why is this a good notion of temperature? You have to ask yourself, what is the temperature? And in fact, in a, you know, when you do, a, let's say the fundamentals of uh, statistical mechanics, basically you define the temperature exactly in this way. So in fact, uh, in my view, at least uh, this is how, at least this relates very closely to how the temperature is actually defined in the first place. And, and okay, so what is it want to say? Yeah, okay, so this I will skip. Okay, so maybe that, that's, that's what I wanted to say on this. So, so perhaps uh, another way to uh, to think about this is that yeah, if I if I take a unit, so so if I if I imagine that the universe is this huge collection of units, and perhaps I only want to study one particular unit among these many, uh, and I ask myself what distribution does it satisfy, it will be distributed according to this uh, probability law, to this PK. I mean, yeah, maybe my comments about the definition of temperature was not very, um, very easy to follow. But uh, I, I just mean that if you if you want to build statistical mechanics from the bottom up, you're going to start by some combinatorics, then you're going to introduce the entropy, then you know th there is some notion of energy which is given uh, 
uh, by by the by the specific uh, system you look at, and then the by definition the temperature will will, will relate to how the entropy changes when you change the energy. So it's uh, okay. Yeah, I don't know how to explain it better than this, but. Uh, Okay, so, so that was for the motivating uh, ex explanation of what the GIST measure is. It, it arises naturally uh, as a, when you look at a, a subsystem which is uh, in contact with some huge thing uh, that has a fixed energy. Let's see. Okay, so, so that's one physical way to think about it. It's also useful to remember that I like to think about uh, you know, taking exponentials of things as uh, we're going to compute Laplace transforms of certain quantities. So mathematically, it's also a convenient tool. You know, it's not purely for physical reasons that I want to study uh, what happens when we take our energy function and we look at the exponential of, uh, let's say, beta times the energy. But okay, it also comes from this physics uh, background. Okay, and yeah, I could. So, so for, from here, if you want, you can also derive. Um, yeah, so, so I, if you want to play a bit more with this formula, you, you can check, for instance, that the, the entropy, you can rewrite it as a log of Z uh, plus beta E bar. Okay, it's a, it's, a, it's a simple computation, which I don't want to do, but, uh, and, I don't know if you remember your thermodynamics classes uh, uh, back in the days, uh, but uh, so so this is the so so at least when I was exposed to this uh, uh, at school, I was told that you know so so beta is the inverse temperature, and the formula was presented to me by multiplying by temperature. So I would have T times S equals the uh, the energy. Plus the this this guy called the free energy. So the, so so this guy up to multiplication by temperature is the free energy. So so z. So I, if I was if I was really wanting to use accurate terminology, I should call it the Helmholtz free entropy. I think, but I'm going to call it the free energy. Okay, and so so I can write it explicitly. Z is the what what makes it normalized. So it's the sum of the exponentials. Okay. All right. So that was a quick uh, motivating discussion about what a GIST measure is. And now I want to, before I, I turn to the Curie-Weiss model, I will talk about a model which is actually more complicated, but it was uh, historically introduced uh, first, and it's the Ising model. Or at least it's my understanding that the easing model was introduced first. Maybe I'm wrong. Okay, so uh, maybe as a, again, some bit of historical background. Um, so around the year 1895, there was a Pierre Curie who was doing experiments in his lab with magnets. And he observed that he could um, impart magnetic properties to a material by submitting it to a magnetic field. So, so you, you, you take this piece of material, which uh, now is called a ferromagnetic, you, you put it in, in some magnetic field, and then you turn off the magnetic field and the, the material will uh, retain magnetization. It will still be a magnet. Okay, he observed that and I mean, that's, you know, we have you know, magnets had been observed for a very long time. But what he observed, which was more striking, is that he could destroy this magnetization property by increasing the temperature. So he observed that if he raises the temperature, 
at some point, this capacity of the material to uh, retain magnetization would disappear. And, and so then people call this uh, paramagnetic uh, behavior when uh, some material is not able to retain magnetization. And uh, I don't know, I don't think he came with an explanation. He just observed that this was happening. And, and, uh, and there is this critical temperature that separates ferromagnetic to uh, paramagnetic behavior, which now is called the Curie temperature. And then I think uh, shortly afterwards, uh, Pierre Weiss came up with some explanation of what at the time they called the magnetocaloric phenomenon. Magneto, because there are, there are magnetization uh, involved and caloric because temperature is involved also in the question. And okay, I'm not completely sure what he did exactly, but uh, I suppose that he used, uh, let's say, old style uh, thermodynamics to try to understand what was going on. And then, uh, okay, some time passes. And in the 20s, um, uh, Wilhelm Lenz uh, proposes to his student Ernst Ising to study uh, a theoretical model of uh, a magnet. And the proposal is we, so we, we place ourselves on ZD, let me uh, draw, I'm going to draw a two-dimensional piece, or maybe a, a finite subset of ZD, let's say a box. So let's say a box. And at each side, uh, there is a plus one or a minus one. So maybe here's plus one, it's a minus one, etc. And, and uh, we think of each site, you know, a plus one or minus one as encoding a microscopic magnet, which has uh, two possible orientations, maybe upwards or downwards. And, and locally, um, the, these uh, uh, tiny magnets would like to rather be aligned rather than not, okay, because it, it feels a, it's energetically, energetically more favorable that the two neighboring magnets are going in the same direction. So Ising, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Lenz suggested to his student Ising to think about this model in a more theoretical way. So, so let's say a BN is, is the box of size N in dimension D. And the configuration in this problem is a vector of plus ones and minus ones indexed by the size of the box. And then the energy of the system, energy of the configuration I'm going to call it HN of sigma. I'm going to define it as the sum of sigma i, sigma j for i and j in the box, which are neighbors of one another. Okay, so this uh, i uh, twiddle j is to denote i is a neighbor of j in the nearest neighbor graph. Okay. And I should put a minus sign uh, because it's more physically reasonable to, so, so this sigma sigma j is one if the two, so these microscopic magnets are called spins. So if the two spins agree, uh, this is one. And if they disagree, it's minus one. So as I phrase the problem, the system would rather try to maximize HN of sigma. Okay, but physics pieces prefer to minimize the energy but I, I don't want to keep track of too many minus signs, so I, I will not put a minus sign in front. But uh, you know, most people will put a minus sign here. Okay, and now, uh, okay, this is the energy function. So clearly it's, it's most favorable that uh, if we want to just maximize the, this energy function, we're just going to put all the sigmas to be plus one so, so that everybody agrees or all the sigmas to be minus one, so that also everybody agrees. But in real life, uh, you know, when we have our magnet, it's not really managing to find this optimal configuration because there's a lot of thermal noise. 
And, and so instead of saying that the system is trying to optimize its energy, we should follow the prescription of Gibbs that I described, which is to say, to postulate that the system will in fact um, distribute itself according to the Gibbs measure associated with this energy. So at inverse temperature beta, Uh, we find the system in configuration sigma with probability proportional to the exponential of uh, minus, or oh, sorry, no minus, exponential of beta times the energy. So proportional to, oh, I'm going to actually write the. Uh, with probability. Uh, I'm still going to call Z the normalization factor, but now it depends on N, oops, and on beta, and then exponential of beta HN of sigma. Okay, and Zn is so that the sum of the probabilities is equal to one. Okay, and perhaps if we want to uh, be more faithful to, if we really want to mimic this experiment of Curie where he was submitting these pieces of material to an external magnetic field, I should also add a term that encodes this external push in your direction. So let me add this, so with, with external, external field, which I'm going to encode by a parameter h. So now the probability depends on beta and h. So I'm going to write Zn of beta and h and then exponential of beta hn of sigma plus this extra push. So all of the I'm adding this term to the energy function. Oh, sorry, not this, so I in the end. Okay, so if H is positive, I give a, an extra energetic reward to having sigma uh, being plus one. So, so H is pushing uh, the spins uh, in the direction of the sign of H. And of course, the, the higher, the larger H, the more the push is significant. Is it clear what probability measure I'm talking about? So it's a probability measure which gives the, the probability as displayed here to a configuration sigma, where Zn is so, so that when we sum over all possible sigmas, we get one. So perhaps you, you would object that um, this should be part of the energy function and so really I should you know, put the beta like this, you know, because we said it's beta times the energy function and you would be right. But mathematically it's more convenient to, to be allowed to play separately with beta and H. So I'm not going to, parenthes to put parentheses like this. Okay. We, we are, after all, we are going to do mathematics. So you know, it, it, we have to make our life uh, as convenient as, po as possible from a mathematical point of view. This way it's best to, to define it like this. So, so the point of the sigma sigma j is that what I want to say is, is I want to make sure the, what I want is, is to say that the two neighboring spins should agree with each other. Okay, I don't say I want them to go up or I want them to go down. I just want to say uh, they, they, they have to agree with each other. Okay, so, so once we have defined the, this, this probability, we can try to compute the mean, the resulting magnetization on the, in the system. So, which, which is, so, so the resulting magnetization is maybe the, the mean of, uh, of, these, uh, of these sigma i's under this measure. So 
let me write this. So the, the resulting be induced, maybe I could say. I'm going to denote it M sub capital N. And so it depends on beta and H. I'm just going to write some more sigma. Okay, and I'm not rewriting, but it's the same. Uh, this dot 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 is, is the same as uh, what is in this exponential. Okay, so, so, so what I'm doing here is that I'm looking at this object, sum of sigma i divided by the, the number of uh, sites in the, yeah, this is just the mean magnetization. So, so this is the mean magnetization taken with respect to this probability measure. Okay, and I want to see, I want to see if in my model, the observations of uh, Mr. Curie uh, are, are showing up as well. Okay, so as a, as a first pass, maybe I can just try to plot how this object behaves and I just take N to be very large, okay? And so, so what happens is that, so for small beta, the curve looks like this. So it's really uh, the, the most reasonable thing you can imagine because, well, by symmetry, the, this magnetization will be an odd function. And if you really insist on putting H extremely large, you will force the spins to be plus one. So to H uh, plus infinity, it will go to one. And in the middle, it will be zero, and then it's, it's odd. So it will have a, you know, the shape will be sort of like this. Oops. Okay. <laughs> it goes through zero here. Then it, it, the, the limit uh, to the left and the right is, is uh, uh, minus one and one. So it stabilizes like this when we, so this is H and the curve is the resulting magnetization for N very large. But for, for large beta, uh, what we observe instead is that uh, there is a discontinuity near at zero. So it's, it's still, when H goes to infinity, it still goes to one. And in the other direction, it goes to minus one. But there seems to be a jump. Yes, yes, yes. There seems to be a jump at the origin. At least you know, when we take N very large, you know, for, for any fixed n, the function is, is continuous in H, but uh, when n becomes large, it, it seems to be really extremely steep. And in fact, we can show that, uh, okay, so, yeah, so, so just to, to stick with the history of the problem, in fact, uh, easing focused on the, on the case in dimension one. And in dimension one, he showed that for any beta, even in the limit, this curve is actually continuous. There is no jump, as I kind of try to picture here. And if you if you do exercise one of the second problem set, then it's uh, a derivation of this fact that uh, that this object is actually continuous even after you pass to the limit. And then uh, nothing much happened until. Uh, around 1936, when uh, Rudolf Piles showed that in fact, in dimensions two and larger, indeed, there is a discontinuity in this curve when beta is sufficiently large. So, so this is for, so discontinuous. For D larger than or equal to two. 
So because I could not resist trying to uh, outline the argument of Pyers to show that indeed there is a discontinuity here. So I also put it in the second problem set, but uh, it's somewhat tangential to the main point of the of this lecture. So if you have time to think about it, I think it's uh, it's really uh, a very nice uh, piece of mathematics. But uh, you know, like if you are overwhelmed by the the, the amount of problems you have to do, uh, don't worry. Um, okay, so. Yeah, maybe maybe I can take a short break. So let's say uh, uh, ten minutes of, or maybe somewhere between five and ten minutes of of pause. Uh, now, ah, yeah, sorry, good question. What is interpretation? So so this matches, I think, uh, the the experiments of uh, of Pierre Curie because you see that if you if you take your system. And you you apply a tiny bit of H positive uh, to to your system. It will in fact spontaneously organize itself into something which has a lot of uh, a lot more pluses than minuses. Okay, so so just because you you give it a little bit of a suggestion to go towards the plus, it will it will spontaneously align itself uh, in the plus direction. Okay, because it, it you know the, the neighbors they want to be aligned with one another. So in principle, you yeah, I should have explained this more. Thanks for the question. So in principle, your your system is really trying to to make sure that two neighboring spins uh, agree with each other. So if you take this uh, literally, then you will have to align all the spins. But in fact, because there is this extra disorder thing, it's not always happening, and it depends on beta and it depends on dimension. Uh, let me let me display again the measure. So yes, yeah, someone in the chat. Asked, so so the dot 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 is is really uh, what is here. So you see in in this sum, in this sum that is here, there is a competition between trying to optimize what is in the exponential. And you know the best thing you can do in the exponential is setting all the sigmas to be plus one. Let's say h is positive. This is what maximizes what is inside the exponential. And if, if this was the dominant term in the sum, then you know this term will be one, and what you would see uh, as the mn would be just a plus one. But this is not uh, the entirety of the story because uh, you know, maybe the other configurations, they get a smaller term in the exponential, but there are much more of them. So even though they are kind of, uh, you know, not performing so well in terms of the value of this exponential, uh, they are so numerous that in fact, this is, these are the guys which dominate the sum. Just to make things clearer, imagine beta is equal to zero. And let's say also H is equal to, okay, yeah. Maybe H is only extremely tiny, so you have only a tiny bit of a incentive to be positive. Then this this magnetization will be very very small. You know the the H will have extremely little effect on the on this quantity. And as you increase the beta, the this competition between you know the the weak guys which are numerous and the strong guys which are fewer uh, turns in the favor of the guys which are. Uh, fewer but uh, more powerful in the exponential. Does that make sense? Cool. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, so I see maybe I was not very clear with this alpha and beta. So, so what I wanted, so let me go back to, um, to what I'm trying to do here. I'm saying that the set of P's that we care about, they have satisfied the constraints, which are those two constraints. The, for this total energy to be preserved, they have to satisfy this. And also the, you know, the, the sum of the fractions have, have to be one. And also, okay, they are non-negative, but this, this will work, work itself out, so let's not worry about this. But so, so this, you know, if I want the configuration to be allowed, I have to satisfy these constraints. 
But now, among the allowed configurations, th those that will uh, dominate my measure will be those which are more numerous. And this uh, uh, question of cardinality is, is driven by the, the number S of P. So among those configurations, we should maximize S of P. And so the problem I'm trying to solve is, what is the maximizer of S given the constraints that are in the, in the squares? Okay, and, and the, the reason like, you know, any, um, this is, you know, if I fix the P's, the, the number of configurations is, is given by this number, okay, except you replace NK by PK times N. And this number, we said it's, okay, if I take the log, then basically it's N times S of P. Okay, so if I don't take the log, it's exponential of N S of P. Okay, so, so let me go back to my program then. Yeah, so, so I'm trying to optimize S subject to these constraints. And then by uh, Lagrange multipliers, the optimizer has to be such, such that uh, this property holds. Okay, there exists alpha and beta such that for every K, this is true by Lagrange multipliers. And then, okay, then the rest of the derivation follows. Is it clear? And yeah, it's like, you know, when I, yes, so so I, I'll, I'll add one more comment and then I answer to this question in the chat. So when I was trying to explain this uh, competition between you know, this term in the exponential, which is the energy and the, the fact that maybe some other terms are more numerous, you can see it already in this in this formula. You know, this is the energy, and this is the entropy, which counts the number of configurations of a certain type. So, so here, this is a representation of the free energy as a, a combination of entropy and energy terms. Okay, well, that's just a, a side comment, but uh, okay, let me not continue uh, this direction. Uh, so, to come back to to the question in the chat. You see, when, you, when n is fixed, this is, a, this is a totally reasonable function of all the parameters. It's uh, you know, infinitely differentiable in all the parameters, right? Because we're only doing, uh, you know, I, I, I take age, I put in the exponential, I sum a finite number of terms, I do nothing uh, hairy. So, so this function is smooth in the parameters as long as n remains finite. So the discontinuity only shows up after I pass to the limit. Um, so I'm trying to, yeah, so for small beta, uh, indeed the, what happens is that the, you know, the, the it's the force of the numbers, you know, the, the fact that the, the configurations with uh, small magnetization are much more numerous is what overwhelms the sum. So, so the guys which have a better energy term, the energy term is what is here, they are not numerous enough to compensate. So that's what happens for small beta. And for large beta, it's the other way around. Like the, you know, the, the numerous guys, they, they don't win out and the, the, the exceptional guys uh, dominate. Um, okay, so how do we justify that we use the Gibbs measure in this context? Because when when uh, when Curie does his experiments in the lab, in fact, the magnet is not in isolation with respect to the universe. It it has a given temperature, which is which is uh, prescribed by the fact that it's you know in the lab and stuff, and so it's going to be you know it's going to be bombarded by. Uh, exterior things, it will have some internal uh, uh, disorder uh, provoked by the thermal fluctuations. And so it's, uh, the way it's going to settle down is uh, prescribed by 
the fact that this temperature is fixed in the lab. And this temperature is, is this beta parameter. Okay. Um, yes. Uh, Okay, so maybe that's the. Uh... So, yes, indeed, the discontinuity only happens when after we pass the limit. All right, thanks a lot for the questions. That's, uh, that's really nice uh, for me to get feedback because uh, you know, it's much easier for me to gauge if uh, you're with me or not if you ask questions. Otherwise, I just don't. All right, so so I want to, you know, these were drawings that maybe nowadays we can do on our computers, but but now how can we do mathematics um, concerning this quantity, especially uh, when it comes to understanding the large, you know, the, the limit behavior, we have to uh, resort to more theoretical arguments. So instead of trying to uh, focus on on this quantity directly, I want to focus on but from now on, we call the free energy. So it's the, the log of this of this Z parameter. So let me write this. So let's let's study or consider the free energy. I'm going to denote it Fn of beta and h. So it's the, okay, I'm going to normalize by one over n. Okay, or one over the volume, sorry. So if I, if I rewrite Zn of beta, explicitly you know it's this normalization uh, constant so it's the sum of the exponentials over all possible config configurations this is the sigma Okay, so maybe at first sight you think uh, um, it's kind of bizarre to study this quantity. So hopefully I'm going to answer this question. Uh, yes. Yeah, so so why do we why do we want to study this quantity? Like it, it's kind of at least at first sight. Maybe now I said already so many times that uh, I think of this as a Laplace transform that it's less surprising. But initially you may think ah, oh, but uh, this is the normalization constant in a probability measure. Why do we care about the normalization constant? What we want to understand is the probability measure, not the normalization constant. But the point is that, yeah, indeed, um, I think it's best to think of this as a Laplace transform or moment generating function of the vibrates we care about. And in particular, uh, here I can display rather clearly why this object is interesting. Be because if I differentiate in H, what will uh, pop out is precisely this mean magnetization MN. So let me do this calculation. So observe that. When I differentiate in H, this quantity, Well, okay, there's still the one over this normalization I put there. And then when I differentiate the log, I get you know the derivative divided by uh, the object itself. And the derivative, so let me try to do this computation in, in one shot. So when I compute the derivative of this thing here, this, this sum over sigmas, what will happen is that um, maybe I should use this. The, this. This term here will be brought back in front of the exponential, right? That, that's what happens when we differentiate with respect to h. 
I'm going to write it. I don't know why I didn't want to write it. So it's sum over sigma, oops. Sorry. And then sum over i of sigma i times the exponential of blah, blah, blah. Okay, same, same thing. Uh, dot, dot, dot is this uh, beta hn plus h sum of sigma i divided by sum over sigma of exponential of the same thing again. And we recognize the, the mean magnetization here. Okay, so let, let me display it uh, one more time. So I'm going to scroll back up to display the mean magnetization. It's here. So we have sum over sigma of sum over sigma i exponential of blah, 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 divided by uh, this Zn, which is the sum of the exponentials. Okay, so. This is exactly mn of beta h. This is equal and the point is that you know if you have two you know if if you if you care about the derivative of a function it's it's going to be easier for us to try to understand the convergence of the function itself versus trying to directly confront with the convergence of the derivatives. Okay, so so the, the function itself will be more robust to small modifications of the, of the model, for instance, or so it will be easier for us to have access to Fn and then deduce later information about its derivatives rather than try to directly confront the derivatives. Does that make sense? So even though maybe in truth, what I really care about is understanding this MN function, I'm going to first concentrate on, uh, on studying the function Fn. And then uh, you know, at, at a later stage, I'm, I'm going to wonder whether the derivatives of Fn converge to the derivatives of the function itself. And in fact, it's... Uh, it's not uh, very difficult to show that this function does converge. Uh, to some limits. And, and moreover, indeed, the uh, uh, so moreover, So it's not difficult to show that it converges, but uh, identifying what is the limit, this is a more difficult question. Ah, because, because in the MN guy, there is one over Z, if you remember. So I, I, there's a question in the chat about uh, what happens to, sorry, I'm flipping back and forth. There's a question in the chat about what happens to this guy, as far as I understand. And this thing is, is, is the one over Z in the previous formula. Yeah, and, and moreover, so this I'm going to explain later, but for now, I just to take it for granted. The thing is, wherever F is differentiable, indeed the derivatives of Fn converge to the of F. So one can show, oops. That the derivatives of Fn converge to those of F wherever F is differentiable. And this is based on the fact that these functions are convex differentially. So, so in this context, uh, you 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 use you use a subadditivity type of argument. Uh, you, you you look at Fn on the big box and you try to compare with 
uh, systems in uh, in smaller boxes, and you try to show that this forms a Cauchy sequence. But uh, okay, yeah, I'm not going to go too much into this, but it's uh, it's possible. And, and also for those who know already a bit about the Ising model, you could make it so that uh, you you impose some bizarre, uh, like some specific boundary conditions at the boundary of the domain, like maybe. Uh, you could imagine that the these spins are in contact with those outside of the box, and those spins outside of the box have a fixed uh, orientation, maybe plus one, maybe minus one. And one way to uh, kind of observe that this function fn is nice is that the limit that you get does not depend on these boundary conditions. Okay, so it's a very uh, stable quantity in some sense. And, and the derivative thing is with, with respect to any derivatives. So if you look carefully at this function fn, it's, it's, a, it's a jointly convex in both variables. And using this, you can show that wherever f is differentiable in h, the derivatives in h converge to the derivative in h. And wherever it's differentiable in beta, the derivative in, in beta of fn converges to the derivative in beta of Okay, so, so all this to say that um, if we could, uh, instead of just saying, you know, this limit exists, if we could put our hands on what this limit is, that would be really great because we would completely uh, be able to answer the, these observations of, uh, of, uh, that I just did that, uh, earlier, you know, with the graphs, with the discontinuity or without discontinuity. Okay, because what, what this predicts is that at the level of the function fn, it will be at least c1 uh, when beta is small. And, and then um, when beta is large, you know, the plot I, I gave is in fact the plot of the derivative. So it means that the function is having a corner at the origin. Uh, the, the derivative when you approach to the left is negative and stays away from zero. And then when you approach to the right, it's positive and it, and it stays away from zero. So it has a, a corner at the origin. So, so in some sense, if we could identify this limit and, and observe that it has these properties, then we would be able to assert rigorously that these pictures I drew of these uh, graphs is actually valid. So it's, it's not an easy task. So, so in the second problem set, the first exercise, allows us in fact to compute this limit explicitly. No, so we say fn converges to limit f and, and here it is and, and we display it. But in higher dimension, it's in general a, a bit of a hopeless task to compute explicitly, you know, to give a formula for what is the limit. But, and this is just a historical comment, but I think it's a very important uh, thing to have in mind. What really uh, made the Ising model so important in the history of statistical mechanics is that at some time, at some time, uh, uh, I think in the late forties, uh, Onzager uh, observed that he can in fact compute e exactly the limit for energy of the two-dimensional model. Okay, and Onzager and, and, and I think uh, uh, Schrager and uh, Young also contributed to to this. So, so that was a that was a striking achievement, which is obtained by some rather ambitious generalization of the argument that uh, that is used in in the one-dimensional case. Uh, so, if you solve this one-dimensional case, you will have a glimpse of how it works also in the two-dimensional case. And and it really. Uh, struck people because uh, on Zagger uh, using these exact computations could not only verify that this jump occurs because this was already known to uh, to Pyers, but he could also understand precisely what happens at the transition. You know, when, when you switch from um, ferromagnetic to paramagnetic behavior. So on Zagger, computes uh, the, this, this f for d equals to. 
and in particular, so, so he, he showed that indeed, so you know, there is a critical temperature at which uh, the discontinuity is about to emerge. And at this critical temperature, the curve starts to look very singular uh, near the origin, and he could show that. So this is the picture in H of this mean magnetization. So normally it's a smooth thing, but uh, when when you are at the critical point, you know just before the emergence of this uh, germ discontinuity, he showed that the the behavior of the function here is like H to the power of one over fifteen. And I think uh, before that, nobody had any clue that uh, a 1 over 15 would, would appear in this problem. And similarly, so if, so let's say for, for beta larger than beta c, but, but close to beta c, then once the discontinuity emerges, you know, so this is just a little bit above beta c, uh, he, he showed that this, this gap that starts to emerge behaves like, beta minus beta c to the power of one over eight. So this is when uh, when beta uh, goes to beta c from above. And this also was really uh, completely unexpected. And so later we study curry vice. I'm going to explain what curry vice is. And, and these exponents are different for, for, for curry vice. So, so that really struck people, and, and that also uh, told people that, first of all, there were lots of things they did not understand about critical phenomena, and second, that, in fact, uh, it was not a hopeless task. Uh, for this model, we could actually say something about critical phenomena. And because of these two related aspects of, you know, you don't understand, and actually <laughs> there are things to be done there, uh, this triggered an enormous amount of activity uh, in uh, in, in, in a sequel, like the statistical mechanics became a, a very active topic as, as a result. Okay, so I think the, the main message I wanted to convey uh, with this discussion about the easing model, well, first, I think it's, it's interesting to, to have some uh, background about uh, where statistical mechanics come from. And, and second, uh, I think it's also the takeaway messages I want to that you take from this is that first there is this quantity called the free energy, and it looks a bit innocent perhaps at the beginning because it's just the log of this normalization constant. But in fact, it's a very convenient tool to study because if we understand it, then later we can recover useful information about the system we care about by taking derivatives. Basically, when we compute derivatives, we we compute um, mean values with respect to the Gibbs measure. And the second thing is, yeah, so uh, it's, it's therefore uh, very attractive to try to compute the free energy and uh, you know, it's not always possible. Uh, we, we don't know how to do it for the easy model in dimension three, for instance, or in any other dimension. But, uh, but if we can do it, then uh, we should you know, try our best to do it. Um, all right, and, and the, so are there questions? Maybe I should. So I don't quite understand the question in the chat. Um, not that I so not that I know of. Or yeah, so I don't see connections with the two topics mentioned in the chat. So, so if, if this made sort of sense, I want to uh, start to introduce now uh, the Krivice the model per se, which is the model I really want to focus on for a long time. So I think it's the third part. So I don't know if uh, maybe some people will uh, uh, will know more about this than me, but as far as I understand, the Curry-Weiss model was introduced uh, actually uh, kind of later 
uh, maybe around the 50s. So at least, uh, you know, I did not uh, go very deep into the papers of Weiss, but I'm not sure if he actually introduced the model uh, as we know it now. Um, but uh, okay, anyway, so maybe just to summarize before I, I define the curve Weiss model. So, so there are there are two useful properties of the easing model uh, that, that we like to use when we study it. One is a, a property I, I alluded to uh, when someone asked me, how do you show convergence of the free energy? Is that you, you can make a box decompositions. You, you can say, okay, I'm studying this problem in a big box. I'm going to think it's just a collection of these sub boxes. And maybe if I understand, you know, if I can compare what happens in a small box to what happens in a large box, I'm going to learn something about my system. So that, that's one property which is useful. And the other property is that it's, uh, it has a monotonicity property. So let's say that H is, is positive. Then if, you, you know, if I take a, a spin and I put it to plus one, this will increase the probability that the other spins are also uh, in plus one. Well, it doesn't depend on the H actually. So it's always the case that when you, when you take a spin and force it to be plus one, you're increasing the probability that the other spins are also plus one. Okay, and this is a, this small tonicity property is very useful when we study the model. And, and these two properties will, will be destroyed when we, when we look at uh, these spin glass models like the SK model I discussed at the, in the first lecture. But for now, I don't want to destroy both at the same time. I want to keep, uh, I don't want to add randomness into the problem. I just want to simplify the geometry. So, so the, the easing model, it's defined on this grid. And instead of the grid, we're going to assume that all the units interact with all the other units. Okay, no geometry, or if you want uh, the geometry of the complete graph. So this will actually destroy the possibility to, to do decomposition into boxes because there is no really box. And if you try to, you know, when everybody interacts with everybody else, if you try to make subsystems, of size, uh, you know, half of the total size, then you cannot really neg neglect uh, boundary contributions. So you know, when you're on RD, um, if, you, if you decompose RD into, uh, let's say a, a box in dimension two into four subboxes, the boundary becomes negligible as N becomes very large. But when, we have, when we're on this complete graph uh, type of interactions, when everybody interacts with everybody else, it is no longer quite possible to you know, split into two problems and say that uh, boundary interactions uh, are kind of negligible in the limit. So, so we will lose this, uh, this feature. On the other hand, because we simplified the geometry so much, surely we will gain a lot in terms of, uh, uh, you know, like the, the difficulty of the problem will, will reduce significantly because the geometry becomes so simple. Maybe another way to think about it is that when you do this uh, model in the easing model in the box, there are very few, you know, the group of symmetries is relatively small. When, when you do the, this model where everybody interacts with everybody else, all of the permutations leave the model invariant. Okay, so you have a huge group of symmetries and this should help us in some way. All right, so, so let me uh, define the model and, uh, and then we, we will resume uh, from there next time. So the Kruger-Weiss model. which trivialize the geometry. By making every spin interact with every other spin.
so so the the energy function now so so maybe I should say first the configuration so now there, there's no point to keeping this indexation by uh, vertices in the box okay so I'm just going to um, to think of the configurations as being a vector of plus ones and minus ones of length n. And the energy of the configuration sigma of a configuration sigma, I'm going to stick with the notation Hn of sigma. I'm going to, so, so now I'm going to uh, put the, the parameter. So instead of beta, I'm going to write T and you, you will, you know, because I already alluded to the fact that at some point there will be partial differential equations, kind of nice to have a T at this place. So I'm going to call T where uh, I use beta uh, so far. Okay, so T in some relatively unfortunate <laughs> circumstance, T, you should think of this as being the inverse temperature. Okay, so a little T, it's the inverse temperature. So T over N times sum of sigma I, sigma J. So now it's sum over all I and J. Okay, so, so there are N square terms in this sum. And because I want to keep my energy being over the N, and, and here there are no stochastic conciliations. Okay, so, so this has potentially, potentially will be over the N square. I divide by by n so that it stays over in total it stays over the n. T is a parameter it's a parameter that is a, is the inverse temperature. So for each for for T positive and H positive. And then I'm going to keep the this magnetization guy. Ah, uh, yes. So so it's for that when I sum over all the. So so there's a question in the chat about my including the case i equal j in the sum, and. That may look a bit strange, but this term is, is does not depend on sigma. And when you build this Gibbs measure, you know, I'm just prescribing that the probability should be proportional to exponential of Hn of sigma. So if I if I change Hn of sigma by by constant, it will just uh, multiply all these exponentials by a constant, and so in fact it will not matter as far as the probability is concerned. Okay, because in any case, we have to normalize the, the measure. Yes, th does it make sense? Like we're saying it should be, the probability measure should be proportional to exponential Hn of sigma. I'm going to rewrite it later, but just to clarify this conversation. So if I add a constant to this, you know, if I say, if instead of telling you, oh, it should be proportional to exponential of Hn of sigma, I tell you, oh, it should be proportional to two times exponential of Hn of sigma, uh, nothing has changed, right? I'm saying the same thing. So that's, that's what I mean. So here, yeah, I find it slightly more convenient to, to put this uh, beta parameter inside the definition of H now. So sorry about this. So, so just to, to clarify the definition. So, so there is the energy and now the free energy, it should be the normalization constant uh, inside uh, to, to make it be a probability measure. So Fn, I'm going to call it Fn of T and H. And okay, I normalize by one over N log of this sum of exponentials. Okay, 
Yeah, so maybe I should, I should, let me give it more precise notation. So this is HN of T, H, and sigma. Okay. Maybe it's a better notation. Okay, so, oh yeah, uh, thanks for this question. No, it, this is not uh, relevant. Let me erase this. Thank you for this remark. So H is just a real number. Yeah, I want to keep T uh, non-negative because T is the inverse temperature. We want to keep temperature non-negative, but, uh, but H is any real number. Thanks a lot for this question. And uh, okay, so I'm going to, Add a, a one over two to the end here, so that we it looks more like a probability measure. This thing here, okay, this now is a probability measure. But you see, in terms of this, just changes the function f n by a constant. You know, you can pull out uh, log two here or minus log two. And and so in terms of computing derivatives of this function, this doesn't matter. Okay, it's just to make things. Uh, much more nicely with the large deviations conversation we had earlier. So, so I'm going to define the free energy like this. And now the, the associated probability measure, I'm going to introduce a notation for this. So I don't want to write all the time a sum of sigma of exponential, blah, 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 when I, each time I want to compute some expectation with respect to the GIST measure. So I'm going to use the following notation. So this um, angular, angular bracket of f of sigma. So, so this, you, you should think of this as it's an expectation and, and sigma is the random variable in this expectation. Okay. And by definition, this is, um, so it's the sum over sigma of f of sigma exponential of hn th sigma divided by the sum of over sigma of exponential of hn th sigma. Okay, so this is my Gibbs measure. Does it make sense? Is the definition clear? So for, for this model, I want to ask the same questions I discussed informally for the easing model. Namely, can we understand this uh, mean magnetization for, you know, the, if, if I plot the curve, does it, has a, does it have a jump in the same way? Let me display these curves again. You know, does it look like, okay, you know, the, the curves with the jumps were further above? Perhaps, you know, if, if there is such a jump, then maybe we can ask more refined questions. Like, can we identify, oops, <laughs> that's not what I meant to do. Can we identify the exponent here or the exponent there? Are they the same as for the easing model or not? And yeah, intuitively, it should be easier to answer these questions for, for this model because as I said, the, the geometry is much simpler. Okay, so, so just to, to make sure we connect the, the notations, different notations I used today, the, this mean magnetization, now I can write it just like this. So it's, uh, so here the number of uh, spins is N. And this notation is, okay, if I was, being more more precise about this notation, I should keep here, keep in mind that it depends on t and h, right? But I it's convenient to not write t comma h everywhere, so I don't. But this is the the object I, I want to study, and you know, as before, we can plot it as h varies and, and ask if it has a jump discontinuity when what was called beta, which is now called t, is small or when t is large. Does that make sense? Okay, 
So I think it's, uh, it's about time to stop. So thanks a lot for your attention. And uh, yeah, next time we are going to apply large deviations to understand this uh, QA vice model precisely. Um, I don't remember exactly. So there's a question about these exponents, one, one over 15 and one over eight. Surely they are believed to be valid for other two-dimensional graphs, uh, but um, I don't know how much has been proved. Mm. But, but if you change the dimension, the exponents will change. In dimension three, the exponents are not known and there is no conjecture for what the exponents are. At least, uh, that, at least I'm not aware of any conjecture. And in, in fact, in dimensions four and higher, uh, the exponents are the same as for query vice. So I did, not, I did not say what they are, but uh, they are different. And they are the same as for query vice. And it's proved at least in large dimension or, or, or for um, some modifications of the model. Um, yes, yeah, so, so if you haven't done exercise, so in terms of what you can do, if you haven't uh, done exercise two of the first problem set, I think it's, it's worth having a look, maybe uh, not necessarily justify every, everything, but at least uh, understand how it relates to the thing I discussed today. And then you can try to compute the, the limit free energy of the easing model in one in dimension one. This is the first problem, the first exercise of the second problem set. And uh, yeah, there's a great question about, is there a connection between high dimensional easing on the lattice, like a high dimensional lattice easing model and the Kuevice model? And the answer is, is uh, yes. And uh, the reason is in, in very high dimension, the, yeah, okay, it's not super easy to explain, but the, in some sense, the, the loops of the graph become less significant. In some sense, the, yeah, maybe it's not the best way to explain it. Maybe I should just say that um, in some sense, the Kuevice model is when you, the dimension is N and you let it grow uh, with, the, with the system. So maybe it's plausible that there is a connection between very high dimensional easing and Kuevice. Maybe you could think as a first pass to let the dimension go to infinity with n even, and maybe Kuevice is doing something like this. And uh, and and indeed, uh, it has been proved rigorously that the the exponents that show up here. So instead of one over fifteen and one over eight, different exponents show up for Kuevice, and uh, maybe I. I I won't reveal what they are because uh, it's it's one of the questions in the problem set, but maybe next time I can say what they are. 